Okay, thanks, Vadim. I'll be talking about enabling technology for live programming and um, about a meta language I constructed for doing that. So let's start with live programming. Live programming empowers programmers with immediate feedback about gradual changes to the code. And key are input mechanisms that let programmers perform what I call coding actions, valid changes to the code. So syntax errors are not coding actions and feedback mechanisms that allow you to perceive what the effects are and evaluating if an action was successful. So let's go to a coding cycle. It starts with intentions. The programmer performs actions via some uh, input mechanisms. This has an effect, which is quantified, and then it is displayed in some meaningful manner via mechanism, interpreted by the programmer, and then evaluated. And then if you're not a very experienced programmer yet, you discover that you haven't yet achieved your goal. Of course, experienced programmers have amazing mental models. They predict many things correctly. But even experienced programmers do make mistakes. The idea is that live programming speeds up these cycles. And it has compelling benefits. Namely, you form mental models. Your predictions become more accurate. You learn cause and effect relationships. And this is a very important thing for uh, live programming, that you actually see why something happens. And you can ask why questions about it. And that allows you to uh, predict the effects of your decoding actions and make targeted improvements to the code. So the research focus uh, in this talk today is about running programs, live programming, that keeps test cases running and domain-specific languages to deliver feedback that appeals to the imagination. Now, the challenge is creating DSL interpreters that power live programming environments, and that is uh, complex, uh, time-consuming, and error-prone. I will show that a bit later. So there is a, a problem of uh, that there is no uh, enabling technology. The generic language technology for developing change-based interpreters is really available. So we need uh, abstractions and techniques for constructing such uh, domain-specific languages. And uh, these languages need to have runtime state migrations and support scenarios with eventualities as fixed points and to express trickle effects. So I will be talking today mainly about the effects and not so much about the mechanisms. I had to talk about that yesterday. So let's go to an example in game design. So uh, this is a tiny life game engine. And what I explained at the CVE open day, our institute had an open day. Many kids came there with their parents. And I explained game design to them and actually let them do live programming. And I will explain it a little bit to you too. So many games have, uh, can express their rules as internal economies. And those are a bit like marble machines. And game design is about designing such a marble machine with uh, interesting shoots and levers and designing trade-offs. Where can the marbles roll? What can you choose? What can you buy? What can you collect? And playing such a marble machine, then the player decides what they do with the marbles. And for the kids, that was more or less sufficient to explain to them what game design is about. On the left, we see an actual marble machine. And on the right, we see a figure that uh, yeah, that formalizes it in a domain-specific language. And actually, it is uh, 10 years ago that I first presented a paper at SLE about this particular DSL. So it's quite uh, some time ago. And um, let's go to uh, the engine itself. So uh, the, the, it's called V. It reduces design iteration times. It uh, allows designers to simultaneously prototype and play test the game's mechanisms. And it enables live programming, uh, or it is live programming. Changes have immediate effects, and uh, there is immediate and continuous feedback. And it demonstrates runtime state scenarios. So now I will do something dangerous, which is to actually <laughs> perform live programming live in my presentation. Uh, which, uh, as we see, oh my god, my code is here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this, this is awful. Okay. Um, never live program live. So, 
It didn't do that when I first presented in another place. Yeah, I should have debugged it, thank you. Nope. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, let me see. So, where is the mirroring thing? Anyone have experience with this? Arrange, mirror. Do we know this? Where to click? So your live programming environment runs well, and then you wonder, how do I put it on the display, right? Uh, I thought the calamity would be inv inviting the demo effect, uh, not actually, could I get assistance with getting it to mirror? So I'm trying to mirror what I see on my own display, too. So I can change the arrangement, but I... Okay, the cursor isn't showing. Well, yeah, yeah. it extends the display okay, instead yeah, of mirroring. Okay, so you can put it here, so we should debug it. Uh, oh, yeah, you, you, you want me to do it like this? <laughs> no, yeah, I can't, because hard. I need to see it on my own uh, screen. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, let's go back to the displays. Yeah. yeah Try to open settings and there, is, there are display settings and you can view mm. yeah. mm. the uh, Mirror for this one? Does that work? If you go to the top right. Yeah, finally got it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for suggesting that. Uh, that was helpful. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, the number of pixels is quite a, much, uh, quite a lot lower than I had hoped. Uh, let's see if I can fix that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, no, apparently not, so, hmm? Well, let's just start. So, um, it's designed for a phone which apparently has about four times as many pixels as normal. But, um, okay, I'll start a demo. It's about a girl who lost her bunny. I use this for the open day. And you first click on the circle, then you click on the screen. A circle is now on the screen. What is this? This is the place where marbles can reside. And um, we can um, let the marbles roll here. I cannot fully edit it because it's not fully on the screen, but I can add a rule that allows a marble to roll here. And uh, if it rolls, then uh, there is a marble. And when a marble is in the pool, the girl has arrived. I can add another rule that um, allows her to leave and uh, also make that interactive. We get another button, and now we have a tiny way for the girl to go and leave. Then I can add another node that every time she arrives, she brings an apple. And now I'm running out of screen space because of the insanely low amount of pixels. Okay. Um, so every time she now arrives, she brings an apple. And um, we can see that here. So now she has apples. And um, finally, to uh, wrap it up, and let's see if I can do that, um, I add a way for her to exchange these apples that she has uh, for her bunny. So the marbles are rolling while the software is running. See, actually, live programming is much easier than setting up your display. Um, yeah. So. Um, we now have a tiny game, and we can rearrange the button so that it even fits on this tiny area. Look, now she has two bunnies. That wasn't the story, but you know, she, she exchanged another apple. So um, what can we learn from this? Well, uh, that uh, we have a running game economy, and we have um, a marble machine that basically runs while we're playing with it. It is live programming because it, has, it integrates runtime state and effects and feedback all in the same view and in a rather understandable manner. We don't have to play, uh, press a run or execute things. It just always runs. Well, that was the tiny thing I wanted to show. Ne next time I will make a movie again <laughs> and not do the live, live uh, programming. So, 
I will not switch my display setup anymore. <laughs> so, how to construct such a DSL? I now explain my problem. I guess I'm almost out of time. But, um, so, for providing live feedback, such uh, DSL designs must account for runtime eventualities, and uh, those are valid changes to programs and runtime state. So, and they have to represent a multitude of valid executions and dependencies between the changes to the program and the runtime state. And yesterday I talked about uh, how to use Godot to create this tool, and today I talk more about the effects. The objectives are to address the lack of enabling technology for creating change-based programming environments. The approach is to create a meta language that uh, speeds up uh, the development and it powers uh, the interpreters. And um, yeah, we validate it on existing DSLs. There aren't too many that actually work like this. The first one is uh, the live state machine language, simultaneously running state machines and editing them, migrating the current state, say if you delete the current state, things like that. LiveQL, actually yesterday there was the most influential paper award for this state of the art in language workbenches paper. That's where QL uh, originates. The, uh, this questionnaire language where uh, the, there's a live version that if you um, uh, answer computed, uh, you answer a question, it can have effect on the visibilities of other questions and computed questions. So it, it's actually a kind of, yeah, an iterative, uh, you have to compute a fixed point for getting all the answers again. And so this is quite an interesting case study. And finally, the live mic micromachinations language, which I just showed you about game economies. Let's talk a little bit about framework, if I have the time. Uh, it's called Cascade. I put a couple of snooker balls on the table there to illustrate the idea that these effects, they cause each other. So you can understand them like that. So Cascade is a meta language. It expresses change, cause, and effect. And uh, it's intended for the design of DSL interpreters. It's a rascal program, the compiler of well, just 300 lines of code. It, it generates powerful interpreters, uh, the driving force behind live programming, and at runtime, these execute transformations in sequence and produces transactions that consist of edit operations. Upon completion, these interpreters com commit the transactions to the version history as cause and effect chains, which facilitate answering why questions. And uh, the Delta runtime runs on C-sharp. That, that allows me to integrate it with Godot. And uh, it's almost 6K lines of code. So um, the meta language. So it expresses uh, the states, uh, the syntax and the runtime states as meta models. The actions uh, are, and events are uh, bidirectional model transformations that support uh, exploratory coding. Uh, it has side effects before and after every event, and the relationships uh, can have predictable outcomes to steer the behavior so that when we're live programming, we can learn about how these effects cause changes. And the key is, of course, the cascading changes. These are central to live programming to express these runtime state migrations and account for the eventualities. Now, here's an example of, of the meta model of the tiny live state machine language. Uh, you see on the right the static meta model and the right the runtime meta model, which kind of extends it, but in this case, it's a, a one to many relationship. You can run it as many times as you want. A little bit of code, because of course we're at SLE. <laughs> Um, you see here uh, the, the implementation in Cascade of the Mach class, a bit of it. So you have attributes like you expect, but then you see an effect, uh, which is actually a bidirectional model transformation with a future keyword. It promises that in the future there will be an object uh, of the, uh, the class uh, Mach, and it ha has to have a name, and after executing it there will be a, a machine. The opposite, or the inverse, is an effect that deletes this machine. It promises that in, it will exist in the past, but no longer in the future. And it also cleans up the states and the instances if you shut it down, so that you will again have a correct uh, runtime state. And with these pre and post clauses at the bottom, you can steer it. So the user interface, of course, you need user interfaces for live programming. I just showed you the Godot one. Um, 
so you can develop your own, or you can use the built-in read, evo, print loop uh, before you have a custom UI. Okay, so here's an example of the, the REPL. So you here you have a REPL, and these are sequential commands. You can declare some variables. Here you create a state machine um, by simply uh, yeah, giving parameters and then pressing enter. This hooked arrow is an enter. And then finally, you can print it by querying. So that's simulating the feedback, and we see that a machine called doors has been created. You can also use the REPL to run it and then uh, create an instance by calling that. And then you see that a little star shows it's now in the state closed. So when you start it, it will be immediately started in the initial state. If I, if I would then remove it, it has no longer a valid state, so you have an invalid state machine. But OK, it will try to migrate to a state. So uh, the Cascade framework generates interpreters. And this is the driving force behind live programming. Um, the Delta environment integrates these DSLs in a common runtime, and it schedules and executes uh, events. And it performs these bidirectional model transformations and state migrations. It maintains a version history and a heap, and it updates syntax trees and runtime states. And it generates, and this is key, the effects of the transformations as historical transactions that capture uh, that are captured as edit operations and it preserves the causal relationships that we need to answer these why questions in cause and effect uh, chains and uh, yeah it schedules them so that you can get very complex cause and effect chains so the, the control flow is generated here's an example of a simple uh, transaction these are actually edit operations encapsulated in uh, yeah, in a create uh, event, and they just express what the change is. Here's a more complex one. You can't really see it, but you see all kinds of nested pre and post clauses. This is actually deleting the current state of a state machine, and there are running state machines that then all migrate, and yeah, in the end, you end up in a new valid state based on all the side effects that are programmed. So some results uh, in these case studies that, uh, that I did. Um, yeah, the, the, the volume of the specifications is considerably more concise than the originals. The, uh, the Cascade specifications are small and understandable. Uh, they add traceability for cause and effect of all actions, of all changes that happen. It's rather expressive. Uh, it can express e evaluations as uh, fixed point computations because you can schedule future events to happen. And that's necessary for fixed point computations because you need some moment that you check, am I done or do I need to go again? And by scheduling these future checks, you can then sort of get this cycle to execute again. And it helps a lot with the maintainability compared to the original specifications. Uh, it's more, it reuses side effects and it, it expresses them in an understandable way. And it's, it's good, well, it's relatively straightforward to use Godot to, um, create uh, front ends, both have event APIs. And the benefit of Godot is that this tool that I barely got running in this presentation runs very well on my mobile phone. So yeah, uh, that, but that's a benefit of Godot. They, they deserve the kudos for having such nice uh, cross compilation. So uh, wrapping up, um, so the objectives were to address the lack of enabling technology for developing change-based live programming environments. The approach is a meta-language uh, that speeds up the development of DSL interpreters that power this live programming and validation 3K studies, the state machine language, questionnaire language, and machinations. And future work, and I guess this is also why I'm in this session, omniscient uh, debugging. I want to have an omniscient debugger that uses these cause and effect chains, because then I have a reusable debugger for each of these DSLs that I built. Um, of course, I also want to analyze the cascade specifications. Part of them can be generated. Are they, uh, do they have the properties that are intended at the language design level? And can you prove that valid uh, states result from them? And uh, yeah, of course, generating the visual interfaces as well. The one I showed for the, the, the machinations language was created by hand, and it would be nicer if yeah, they could also be generated. And that wraps it up. Thank you for your attention.
I, I don't know much about this uh, change uh, uh, or events uh, thing that you were, were telling, but basically that's the, the, the framework that you're presenting. It's uh, using deltas in order to, 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 to implement uh, the, the yes. to, to manage the runtime. And how yeah, does, so it, you just that, that, does it scale? Don't you get like... Well, for now, I'm building, I'm building deltas and of course, it's uh, intended for live programming, so it should be immediate, right? I didn't do any uh, speed measurements on it, but uh, the, so far, the experience has been immediate. Um, okay. Yeah, I, I'm building DSLs with it, so it would be interesting to see, can you build bigger languages with it? Um, of course, it, it's, uh, it has a slight overhead because it reflects all the changes at runtime. Uh, and it has to generate edit operations, these, these, uh, these yeah. deltas, and execute them. And of course, it maintains its own heap. So there, there is yeah, bookkeeping going on. And that, yeah, that costs extra time. And um, there's no checks in place. So if I, uh, if I have cyclic dependencies, my scheduler will never stop, things like that. I have but, to But, but I that. guess you, it's usable and you don't have like functional problems because of that it's not like it, it, it's it's already a practical solution yes yeah, okay yeah thank you thank you yes thank you very much for the presentation uh, you had the slides where you showed some cascade code with effects and inverse effects yeah can you go back to it and explain yes. a bit more precisely yeah. what triggers the execution of those effects and inverse <laughs> effects Right. Uh, during a live programming session. Okay, thank you. Um, very nice question. So uh, let's say I click on the screen and I create a node, then it would call one of these create effects. Basically, those events are mapped. Some of the effects you can't di directly call as, as a user, right? So this create uh, e effect here is, um, let's say, it's, it's a coding action. It changes the syntax and then it affects the running program by updating the syntax, but it can have effects on runtime state information as well, that as user, well, while programming, you don't directly manipulate that, but there's other actions, like user actions, that can then trigger a running program to do stuff as well, like pressing the button. Pressing a button will call an effect that calls the evaluator that then calls more of these uh, effects to happen. And so, yeah, that's, uh, does, that, does that explain it a little bit? Yeah, very good. And small follow-up questions. What I'm seeing here is not code that will be actually executed by an interpreter. This code will be translated into edit scripts, and this is what is actually, uh, yes. I mean, the program is patched based on what's generated from those implementations that are actually edit scripts. Yes. Is that it? Yes. So w what you see in the, in the curly braces of create, those are what you could call an edit script uh -huh. because uh, it binds at runtime and then it becomes edit operations. So the, as the edit operations just describe change, like deltas. And here you actually, yeah, so the, um, let's say the, when you delete uh, an object, you don't say the class, but it's an implicit parameter. So that delete mm -hmm. and create are inverses of each other. And the assignment that you see is actually a replacement, but I'm not typing the current value there because then I wouldn't be able to execute it in different contexts, right? But when it then makes the edit operations, it generates them and it immediately applies them like well, op updating an object-oriented database. Yeah. That's okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, th thanks for an interesting talk. I, I have a question about, you know, as you're sort of live programming, editing things, you you must sort of get into a state where the, the thing you've built, the state machine or whatever, is not executable. Yeah. And you sort of have to get to the point where it's then executable again so that you can observe it sort of running. Is that, yeah. is that, and, and is there a, I mean, I was just trying to think if I was building, I was trying to use this to build a, a simple functional programming language so my students could write their little OCaml programs and watch them run, right? Yeah. And then what are the, the effects and inverse effects are, are adding to the, the program, I guess, that they would sort of 
or, or is it mapped down to characters as they're typing and deleting characters in their window? So that seems like very fine-grained as opposed to something that is more coarse-grained, which these feel like where you've created a construct in the program. Yeah. Here you're building a machine or you're building a state as opposed to beginning to draw the circle that is the state, right, which is a very simple, simple action that eventually gets you to the circle that is a state. The, yeah, these are the abstract coding actions and, and, and runtime transformations that happen. Um, Indeed, uh, typing in text, if, if you would fit a textual front end to this where, where you reparse every time, then you have to perhaps do differencing, like di differencing and then finding out which parts are added, and then finding out which, uh, which actions to execute, what has actually changed. But for me, the truth doesn't start with Git changes. Those are inaccurate. It starts with what the user actually does when they change things. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so it, it means that uh, expressing changes to these little programs update it in a meaningful manner, and that each of these changes, whatever you want to communicate back to students who are building their little OCaml programs, yeah, you can. Um, design the effects in, in, your, in your meta description to inform them what does it mean what I'm changing so that they have some intuition of, of what the concepts they are operating on do when they run. And when, when you have more, um, um, let's say, imperative languages, then you need constructs to map that, like probes, uh, to, to get an idea of the big distance between the execution model and, and the runtime model. And what I'm trying to do here is to shorten that distance. That's why I, I scoped it down to DSLs, because sure. the, the, yeah, this mental distance is lower. But but. They're, they're DSLs that have sort of, I guess for me, more easy to understand creation and deletion activities. Um, right, Make yes. a state, remove an edge, those things seem like a crisper, uh, a, they have like a, a more direct, uh, I guess in my sense, so there's an effect or an, you delete it and, and the actions are very clear, where if you're typing code, you somehow need to match those edit actions in the window to well, you, you have in the abstract syntax. Sure, but so if, if you want to use Cascade in that context, then um, uh, retrofit uh, an, an algorithm to it. Like uh, many years ago, we did a thing called textual model differencing. Mm -hmm. And then, um, yeah, it's, it cal calculates the changes. And once you know what the, the change is that, that is being uh, performed by, by, the, by the programmer, then you can uh, cause its effects or enact its effects by running it on the interpreter. But yeah, if you want to have a textual front end instead of the nice visual one, uh, th then you, yeah, you need to do the parsing as well. Right, yeah. right. All right, great, thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Let's thank the speaker once again.